Well, thank you again, Mr. Radabaugh, and good morning once again to all who are, who are joining us, wherever you might be. I wanted to uh, spend today looking at a section of Scripture that is very often tied with the next holy day that we have in line, as was, uh, again, already mentioned in the, in the first message, but the Feast of Trumpets. We very often read this and think about this in regards to the Feast of Trumpets, but let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the wedding feast. It's actually in Matthew 22, but Matthew 21, we get the preamble to that. If you go to verse 23, of Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, Jesus here is having his authority question. Um, that happened quite a bit as the scribes and Pharisees at the time were really trying to exert their influence. Influence is, uh, uh, well, we, we can see it today. There are actually social media influencers, people who are striving to be able to, you know, leverage their ability to get people to follow or to do what they say into some sort of income. And that's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. In fact, you could actually purchase the uh, position of high priest. You could bribe people for it. The, the high priest got to set the, uh, the cost of things. You had, you had the, the temple currency that was not your standard Roman currency. And so they could set that up and down. They could say, this is how much uh, a dove would be or a lamb would be. They would, they would assess your offering that you would bring in. So there was a lot tied up in being the high priest and so they're constantly questioning authority. And as Jesus Christ is trying to point people not to have to think about those things, but really to focus them on God and on God's way of life uh, and how God wanted them to be considering things, that uh, position was really his position that Christ took was often in opposition to the high priests and to the rulers. And so they're questioning his authority. And they ask him, they say, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you what authority, by what authority I do these things. It says the baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe? But if we say, from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. And so you see them trying to figure out, <laughs> is there a way I can skirt around this and slip around? Because they didn't want to tell him. And so they answered and said, we, we don't know. We don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then we see him give a couple parables. The parable of the two sons, one uh, well, we'll just read it. What do you, uh, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And the son answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second, the father did, came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So there are these multitudes. They knew, the scribes and Pharisees knew that multitudes, a throng of people had followed John. You know, that was just a part of their rationale and thinking of giving Jesus a non-answer to his question. So Christ tells them, these other people who relented, who believed, they're going to enter the kingdom before you. Verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went to a far country. And as we go through this, we see that they beat the workers when he sent them to try to get, uh, um, when he tried to get things. He even sent his own son and they killed him. So, verse 41, so Jesus said to them, it says, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to, to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits 
of their seasons, those who are willing to give for all the labor that the, that the, own, the landowner put into it, for the building, the wine press, the tower, having the land in the first place. He says, I'm going to give it to somebody who's going to bear fruit and give back. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, that he, that they perceived that he was speaking of them. So they, they got what he was saying. Uh, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him to be a prophet, much like the multitudes took John, uh, the baptizer, to be a prophet. And so, again, as the scribes, the Pharisees, the, 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 the priests, the high priest and his, and, his, uh, uh, and his court were trying to maintain their authority, they're questioning Christ's authority. And Jesus knows where their mind is going. So here Jesus gives another parable, and this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to read verses 1 through 14. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Sounds a lot like the wicked vine dressers who the landowner had allowed and leased his land to. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their cities. And that's exactly what Jesus said the, the landowner was going to do. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few chosen. This is in the middle of Jesus Christ, kind of talking to the leaders of Judah at that time. The leaders in Jerusalem, and they're trying to, you know, they often made the argument, well, we have Abraham as our father. And he's talking to them about authority. He's talking to them about what they're doing with the opportunity that is set before them. Today we're going to look at three sections of this parable, and we're going to see how they relate to us here on this Feast of Weeks, this day of Pentecost. Right here is Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. This is kind of like a little bit of a turning point because he alludes to God no longer working with the physical nation of Israel, but with people who are willing to listen. God wants to work with people who are listening. And you can actually look back in Scripture in the Old Testament. There are a number of individuals who were not of the nation. You can think of Ruth, the Moabitess, right? There are individuals who are not of the nation. Uh, Rahab, who was in the city of Jericho. Right? There are individuals who were not of the nation that God worked with because he was looking at their heart. Again, this is what God is all about, figuring out the heart of man and those who want to and desire to follow, who willingly will give their life as a free will offering for what we acknowledge and recognize he's given to us. Revelation 2 and 3, when you go through and you read the letters to the churches, they all he who has an ear, they start off, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If we're willing to listen, and this here Jesus Christ is speaking to the Pharisees, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rulers, he's saying, you're taking, you're taking what was given to you. The first opportunity, it's like first right of your refusal. Think of Boaz and Ruth, right? 
her other, her other kinsman, the nearer kinsman redeemer, didn't want to do it. Didn't want to um, do his duty, and so it gave Boaz the opportunity. And there are, there are a whole litany of comparisons there as we look at Boaz and we look at, at that, and that, that's a, another message for another time. But Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you've had your opportunity, now I'm going to go to people who are willing to listen. The first section of this parable that we want to focus on today is in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. You see, because we're after the Pharisees, we are not, I mean, if we can trace our lineage back to Israel and one of the twelve tribes, you know, that, that, that might be great. But we know God was going beyond there. Jesus Christ gave the commission to his disciples to go into all the world, to Judea and Samaria first, and then to... You know, then to the Gentiles, to the Jew first, then to the, the Gentile or the Greek, right? And we see here in this parable, again, verse 9, Go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. If you're married, or if you're thinking about being married, if you're engaged, generally speaking, well, I think the average cost, the last time I looked at it, the average cost of a wedding in, in, a, in the United States was somewhere around like 35, 37 thousand dollars that's quite high that's a lot of money you don't generally generally speaking just invite anyone to a wedding and yet that's what we see here he says go out find anybody anybody who's going to come you know I, I said that he gave he gave the children of israel just like jesus christ was speaking to the scribes and the pharisees he gave them kind of like that first right of refusal for the opportunity to be there and instead of taking, taking that opportunity, they turned their back on it. They made light of it, verse 5, and they went their own way, one to his own farm, another to his business. You know, i got stuff to do. I have to make money. I have to feed my children. Whatever, they were, whatever their excuse was, they were pursuing that instead of wanting to be there at the wedding. And so God, or the, uh, the, the king, sends his servants out to get any who are on the highways. Can you imagine going out to, uh, I don't know, you get a you got a good compilation of, uh, of uh, highways. If you're over at uh, I-50, 51, sorry, not 51, 55, 39, and 74, where they all meet there over on the, the, the northwest corner of Bloomington, and you just, just pick anybody. You're like, oh, that looks like a good car. I'll stop them, and I'll bring them over to the wedding because I'm pretty sure they're going to want to come right now. You know, when you're on a highway, the people who are moving in and out, they're going in to trade, to buy, to sell. They're, they're doing things. Their plans were not to do whatever you think that you want them to do, right? You're not going to stop a car going 70 miles an hour and be like, oh, I'm having a wedding. I'm having, you know, I'm having a cookout. Come on over. Well, since I had nothing else planned, that's not, that's not what we do. That's not generally how we function. But God is saying, go out and just get people from the highway. Anybody you can get. Anybody you can get. Usually when we're doing weddings, we're doing get-togethers, we're being hospitable, it's people we know, right? Uh, if you're doing a wedding, one of the things, if you're, if you're having a meal uh, for, for the reception, you know how much it costs for every one of your friends or family, the big families, like, ooh, I'm not saying that stops you from inviting them, but you remember that it was like, you know, $11 or $20 a head for that plate of food, and you're like, you remember those things, and you're like, this is an investment to do. It's not a small thing. The, uh, the Greek word here for highways is uh, dex, uh, dexodos. It's a point of entry or exit into a city. You think about the gates when Nehemiah shut them off, right? That was the entrance portal or exit into the city. Think about Samson when he just went and he lifted the whole uh, frame of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the gate and he just took it and he went and put it on a hill. That was the entrance. That was the portal through which you had protection, it was the main thoroughfare in order to be able to get in. And God is saying, go out and do this. And he says to find people. Find people. The Greek word here for find is heurisko, which means after searching, to find things sought. It's not you just glance around and pick it. It's like you're finding people. You consider that in this parable, the individual's the who who God initially wanted, or the king initially wanted to invite, they didn't want to come. They had 
better things to do in their minds. And so there's a bit of searching and finding. Because I tell you, again, if we'd go out to a main thoroughfare and we just try to stop people and say, hey, come on over, not everybody's going to be willing to come over. You think about who is going to come over. If you were to just stop, stand on the side of the road with a sign that says, wedding, free food, come on over and here's the time, right? And you actually get people. Consider the individuals who would have the flexibility in their schedule to just stop whatever they were doing and say, yeah, I'll come to that. <laughs> they're one could surmise maybe they're not gainfully employed. Maybe they're, you know, there are all sorts of assumptions that we can put into that. But when you consider generalities of the types of individuals, who would have the opportunity to come? It is, uh, it is a unique, it's a unique uh, uh, crop of people. And likely, as we look around in our congregations, we will notice that we are a, unique crop of individuals we are the we are as it says not the mighty not not the wise right and god chose chose us for a very specific reason because because the first people said no <laughs> but he chose us because he wants to put to shame the mighty let's go to matthew chapter 7 if you want to keep your uh, keep your marker here in matthew 22 we'll be back but matthew chapter 7 Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, where we're talking about what it takes to find the people who are going to come to that wedding. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. There is an action that is necessary. And God sent, or the king sent, in that parable in Matthew 22, he sent his servants out with that action. Knock on doors. Find people who are willing to come. It's no different than what God does for us and asks. The point of this, as we're looking at Matthew 22 and verse 9, is that God has taken effort to find us. It's not just happenstance. He sought us out. And he invited us to be able to be here on this feast day. Consider what Jesus told his disciples. He said, tarry here, stay in Jerusalem. And then he stuck around with them for 40 days to make sure that they would stay. Because he wanted them to stay. He spent the time, he taught them, taught them. he expounded on uh, uh, the scriptures. It became who they were. Instead of just going back to fishing, instead of going back to doing other things, they became entrenched in, committed to being there, being ready for the Holy Spirit to be given on Pentecost. But God has sought us out and He's invited us, and we're here because we answered. We answered. We didn't have something to do on our farm. We didn't have something to do for our business. We didn't have a better thing to do, right? We answered and said, yes, we'll be here. We were willing to stop, to listen, and to change our course from where we were going. That is not an insignificant thing. The second thing I'd like to point out here and bring to our attention is the next verse, Matthew 22, verse 10. Matthew chapter 22, verse 10. So those servants, they went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. It was filled the word here for bad is uh, paneros, and it means to be actively bad of nature, actively bad of nature or condition, to be evil or sick. You know, those are the kind of people that we like to, uh, you know, have as good friends, right? Those are the people we want to be close to, right? Not so much, but these are the people who were willing. You know, when I when I was talking about who would we actually get if we were to go out on Veterans Parkway and try to invite four lanes of highway going each way, invite them to come to anything that we had planned, right? Well, here's who God got. <laughs> here's who the servants got. Those people who are actively bad, right? Actively bad. 
according to Vine's expository dictionary, uh, paneros has a stronger meaning. Paneros alone is used for Satan and might well be translated the malignant one. You think of, I mean, cancer is a ubiquitous disease and uh, definitely not a respecter of persons. But we have benign and we have malignant. Malignant is actively going out. Actively going out. It's spreading. And when you think about that when we're talking about bad, this is actively bad of nature. This is something that is a horrible condition. So some bad came. But there was also, it says, verse 10, both bad and good. The Greek word here for good, agathos. Agathos means actively good in character or constitution. God here is essentially, I mean, he's calling a mixed multitude. It was a mixed multitude that left Egypt. You know, just as Satan can be called and uh, defined by the word paneros, God can be defined by the word agathos. And he is consummately good. Instead of being malignant, you know, it's the same sort of thing when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It grows, or it's like leaven. It expands, you know, it's going to grow up into, either into a tree, the boughs are all there. But God is actively good in the growth and what he does. And likewise, Again, the individuals who came and filled the wedding hall were both actively good, and there were those who were actively bad. What did, what did Adam and Eve have in the garden? They had the tree of knowledge of good and evil, as well as the tree of life. Let's go to there, Genesis chapter 2. Again, hold your place in Matthew 22. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 8. Genesis 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made grow, or made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is where we find ourselves, right? We can also actually let's go um, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because this parallels us. It parallels the individuals who were called from the highways and the byways in, in the parable uh, in Matthew 22. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul speaking here to a, uh, a church that is in a city that was just it was, it was very metropolitan, some might call it progressive, but they were also steeped in idolatry and many other untoward practices. In, Matthew, Matthew, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 it says, Do you not know that the, unrighteousness, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. All of these actively bad people, these malignant people, the kind of people that you look and say, oh no, son or daughter, don't go be friends with them because the bad apple spoils the whole bunch, right? I'm bad. But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our Lord. You see that washing happens. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, a little bit earlier in this book. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22. I've already alluded to this, but we'll read it because we need to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. The Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You see, in other places, it says that a wicked and adulterous generation, a wicked generation, or a faithless generation, seeks a sign. But that's what the Jews wanted. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, because they thought they could reason around everything. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. 
Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, you can say not many business owners, not many people with land, all the guys who said, no, nah, I've got something better to do than come to uh, the wedding, you know? i got to <laughs> get a really big harvest so I can tear down this barn and build a bigger one. God has called those who are not wise, not mighty, not noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. The people who one might say had nothing better to do than to go to this, you know, get a free meal. Come on over. It'll be fun. Maybe, maybe that was our mindset when we initially started. But God has chosen the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen those and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in God. You see, we're starting to get an inkling of what God wanted, what the king wanted for those individuals who came to the wedding feast. As Paul said, there are some horrible people in this town. And some of you guys used to be them. And we're told here, you know, God doesn't call all the great ones, all the individuals who we think would be, just be perfect, but he calls us to put to shame. He calls us in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness. You see, if you take somebody who is weak, foolish, and base, you take an individual who is malignantly bad and we begin to have them be sanctified to be redeemed and to have righteousness instilled into who they are there, there's something that begins to happen there God has as we're looking at and talking about here for Matthew 22 verse 10 God has called specifically gone out go find search it Search it out and find what you're searching for. He has gone out and he has specifically called us as a mixed multitude, a mixed bag of people. We all have our own unique proclivities and foibles. But he called us to come to him as we are or as we were, right? Because in the end, his desire is for that transition to glorify him. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember who we are at our core. Don't forget, yeah, <laughs> that is my background. I was one of those people. Even if I didn't outwardly show it, inside, I was like one of the Pharisees where the outside looked great, but inside was a, a very disgusting and dirty cup, right? Whitewashed tombs. Referenced Revelation 2 and 3 for he who has an ear to hear, right? When God called people, he sent out his, the king sent out his servants to go find people who were willing to listen. He who has an ear, let him hear. Also reference here, Revelation 3, verse 17, that we are wretched, poor, blind, and naked. That's, that's our history. You and I, that is what we were. And in large part, what we're still fighting as we try to as we try to push down the old man this third section let's go back to Matthew chapter 22 third section here that we're going to focus on verses 11 and 12 verse 11 and 12 of Matthew 22 but when the king came in to see the guests he saw a man there without a wedding garment and he was speechless so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? Oh, I misread that. Let me read that back, 11. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man, the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to the man, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. See, 
again, you consider the uh, population that was invited to this wedding. People who are willing to stop what they were doing, to come off of the highways. You know, the servants searched for and found individuals who were willing to listen. And then they brought them in, all who were willing. And, and the banquet hall was filled. At this time, in this culture, there was the understanding slash expectation that whoever was putting on a big event like this, I mean, they were very wealthy that they would supply their guests with the proper attire. Consider, again, I referenced Samson about taking up the, the, the posts of the, the gates of the city, right, and he moved those. Well, you also consider one of the big things that he did that enraged the, uh, enraged the Philistines because he had, he had his, uh, his riddle, right, about the lion, and he said he was going to give them garments for the wedding. Now, I'm going to give you these garments. It'll be wonderful, and everybody thought, well, we're going to be really wealthy because we're going to get all of these changes of clothes. But the wealthy individual would bestow upon their guests the necessary garments. And when the king comes into the wedding hall, he looks around, you know, one of these is not like the others. <laughs> ah, so he, you could spot them because, you know, I know exactly what garments I sent out. And this guy is not in him. It's like you stick out like that sore thumb, right? It'd just be very evident. And so let's actually go back to, to Zephaniah chapter 1. Because this, this custom of giving garments on special occasions was just embedded in the culture of the time. And so people knew that if you were invited, you ought to don You ought to don the, the outfit that was given. Kept turning past Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7. Verse 7. It says, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited His guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children at all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. Does this not... Harken right back to what we got done reading as Jesus Christ's authority was being questioned. As he gives this parable about the wedding feast, the king was angry and he goes and he gets those individuals who beat, or who denied those who beat his servants, he gets them. And they have punishment. Anyone who is clothed with foreign apparel. And this man who was there at the wedding feast was clothed in foreign apparel. Because, the, again, the expectation was, I have given you this, put it on. <laughs> this is what you're supposed to wear. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We'll read here in uh, uh, Revelation 19 verses 7 and 8. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And we see, when we actually read a little bit earlier about the righteousness, we read that in, uh, I believe it was 1 Corinthians 1, that righteousness that begins to occur. Well, here the bride of Christ we're looking forward to that on the day of trumpets, right? The bride of Christ is to be arrayed in fine linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. It's important for us to notice here as we're looking at the parallels between the parable of the wedding feast and where we are today is that God provided, the king provided everything for those who needed to be there, those who he called and who wanted to be there. God has likewise for us provided everything that we need. If we go back to Matthew chapter 22, we heard in the first message talking about friends and heirs, uh, 
joint heirs with Christ. And Jesus tells us, you know, I no longer call you uh, uh, just friends, right? But they're brothers. There's that movement. But there is, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 12, the way that the king speaks to this man. He says, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? How did you come in here without a wedding garment? The word here for friend is hetairos, um, and it means a comrade, a mate, or a partner. He's like, my good friend. You know, it, it actually kind of alludes to a little bit of the conversation that Jesus had with Peter. He says, do you love me, Peter? And Peter says, you know, I, I love you like a brother, a comrade, a mate. It's similar. It's not the same word because this is actually only used um, in Matthew, this word, uh, uh, comrade, mate. He says, my good friend. The root meaning here is derived from that of a clansman or a family member. Somebody who is in the same tribe, the same tight-knit family group, same family member. And it's, again, only used in Matthew. The king here speaking to the man who came to the wedding says, Friend, my close friend, almost like my, my brother, why are you wearing something different? Matthew chapter 26, we actually see the use of this again in a very... Uh, verse 49 and 50 is where it's used. This is the evening of... Jesus Christ's arrest and, and trial. Verse 49 of Matthew 26 says, Immediately uh, Judas went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? When we consider the level of betrayal that we might attribute, and that obviously Judas bore, I mean, he hung himself afterwards, took his own life, but when you think about the weight of the usage of the word, you think about the guilt there and the, uh, that, that Judas bore. You think about the individual who we've read about in Matthew 22, who was there, who had everything provided, everything was cared for, nothing ill was done to him, and yet he still betrayed the individual who provided him with everything. You know, God expects us to prepare ourselves for the wedding. We're here on the day of Pentecost. He calls us as we are. He walked and guided with a cloud and fire. And Moses, they dealt with some stiff-necked people, some bad and some good. He took them as they were, as a mixed multitude of people out of the land of Egypt. He calls us, but He expects us to change. You see, because we should not be wearing the same clothes. It's an interesting parallel there between the children of Israel whose clothes and sandals did not wear out for 40 years and they go into the promised land, they were still wearing the same clothes. And the parallel there, they didn't sustain their obedience. They went in with something different. They weren't able to because they were missing something that we have today, that we have been blessed with the opportunity to have in our life, to have dwelling in us. We are baptized, we have God's Spirit, and He says that Spirit will lead us to righteousness. That Spirit will allow us to begin taking this parable of the wedding feast and making it a reality because we have come in. We have been, oh, I won't say we've come in. We've been called into God's church. Some of us bad, some of us good, a mixed multitude of people, but individuals whom God has specifically chosen. He, he has specifically chosen the weak, the base, not wise, we are wretched, poor, blind, and naked. And God says, here are the garments. You see, and without today, without the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks here, without that, there is no Feast of Trumpets. Because there's no possible way 
that we can prepare our garments. We are not going to have garments that are clean and bright. There will be no righteous acts of the saints because we can't do that oven by yourself because oven by yourself, we've just read, what are we? You know, Paul, saw, Paul said to those in Corinth, as such were you. That's who you were. The fornicators, the idolaters, the homosexuals, the liars, all those people. Yeah, that was you guys. That was me. That was you. That was us. That's who we are without the Spirit. But the Spirit allows us to start changing our garments. And that's what we're called to do. Today is that day where we actually get to start doing our proverbial laundry. We get to start cleaning and working it out. You know, not so dingy, not so gross from 40 years of wandering, not smelling like an old lifestyle that we used to have. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 37, the day of Pentecost. It's, I think it'd be remiss not to turn here. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39. Peter had just given his sermon there on the day of Pentecost. There were a lot of miracles that were happening. There was speaking in tongues. You had the mighty rushing wind, and people noticed that something was different. And he gave them a very impassioned, inspired sermon about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the responsibility that we each need to take for that. And when they heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And he wants to fill that hall. He wants people there. But we need to, as it said in verse 37, we need to be asking, what do we do? And the answer to that is wash our clothes, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, those old ways of life, all the things that Paul listed, all the things that are malignant, all the things that are just consummately bad should be replaced with the things that are consummately good. Again, moving from being slaves to sin to slaves to righteousness. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The day of Pentecost is a very joyous day. It's where we're really essentially accepted as Jesus Christ betrothed. You know, we can go through baptism, we can go through the Passover, the unleavened bread, and working through that, but today is the day that we actually get given the opportunity to really begin cleaning our garments. We've committed to burying our old way of life, and now our fiancé is giving us the means to really live a new one, to really live a new one. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with that? Are we actually going to take advantage of it? Let's read verse uh, 39 again of Acts chapter 2. Because we're told, it says, For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from, the house, from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. See, the outcome, the extension of us taking to heart 
the necessity to wash our garments, to put on righteousness, to put off the old way of living. Right? As we shift, we pivot from one to the other, the outcome is amazing. We move from having that mixed bag of having the good and the bad to having more of the good. Getting rid of those malignant things, cutting those out of our lives. It's quite a blessing to be able to have that, but it requires, again, it requires the Spirit and it requires our submission to the Spirit. As we move forward from the day of Pentecost, from today, knowing and recognizing and acknowledging that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit given and accessible to us, we need to remember that God has taken an effort to find us. He's taken that effort to find us. He sought us out. He invited us to be here on this feast day, and we answered. We said, yes, I'm going to put aside the other things that I had to do. I'm going to turn off the highway. I'm going to come over and do what you had, what you would like to do, what you had planned. And I want to be there. I want to go where you're going. I'm going to prepare for that. But we also need to remember that while we're not called as perfect people, we're not called as perfect people. That is and needs to be our past at our very core. Again, we're wretched, poor, blind, and miserable. That's where we're coming from. And we need His Spirit to change us. We need His Spirit to guide us. And we need to remember that God expects us to build off of those two things. We have to prepare ourselves for the wedding because you can go to the parable of the virgins, right? If we are not preparing ourselves, if we're not fitting the description of the bride who has made her garments clean and bright, we won't be there. And God is going to look at us and say, friend, where are your garments? I gave, them, I gave you everything to do that. What happened? And there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He calls us as we are. He recognizes that we are imperfect. We could, you could say we are the second, third, fourth, fifth string of people. We're not the mighty, we're not the noble, but then he gives us everything that we need, everything that we need to become what he expects. And we need to take advantage of that. And we do that through what today pictures, utilizing the giving of the Holy Spirit.